Hey, 42 here. In a complex statistical analysis undertaken for their book, Who's Bigger? Stephen Skeener and Charles Ward attempted to rank the most significant human beings ever to have lived. The top five they came up with makes for an interesting read. In first place is Jesus Christ. Next is Napoleon Bonaparte. Third, Muhammad. Fourth, William Shakespeare. And fifth, Abraham Lincoln. Just think about that for a moment. On this list, we have two individuals of unparalleled religious importance to around half the world's population, and two men who shaped the future of the continents on which they were born. The other guy? Well, he was pretty good with words. Whatever you think of Skeener and Ward's methodology, Wikipedia was their primary source, the very fact that Shakespeare is even mentioned in this kind of company tells you everything you need to know about the man's impact on the world. He's the most quoted writer in history, outside of the authors of the Bible, picked by Jesus yet again, and his plays are performed more than any others globally by a huge margin. He even introduced some 1700 new words to the English language, including bandit, lacklustre, swagger, and undress. That, I'm sure you'll agree, is one hell of an impressive CV. But even so, the extent to which the man is worshipped, even to this day, is quite astonishing. In fact, he's idolised to such a degree there's even a word to describe the very act of excessively idolising him. Bardolatry coined by playwright George Bernard Shaw in 1901. But whilst Will has attained legendary status today, there wasn't quite so much bardolatry going on in his own lifetime. And not just because the word hadn't been invented yet, it's true that Shakespeare's plays were very popular even then, and that they, along with a couple of other business interests, made him a very wealthy man. But whilst he was considered an excellent playwright of his day, he wasn't universally viewed as the very best. Shakespeare died in 1616, and this good but not that good reputation endured for the next 150 years, until an event held in his honour was organised by England's most famous actor at the time, David Garrick whose name you might be familiar with thanks to the many theatres named after him, including one in London. The event, Shakespeare's Jubilee, reignited interest in the Bard of Avon, and acted as a catalyst for much of the bardolatry that was to eventually piss off George Bernard Shaw. Before long, Shakespeare was firmly fixed in the public consciousness as England's national poet, and leading literary lights of the time, like Voltaire, Goethe, and Victor Hugo were known to be huge admirers. By the middle of the 19th century, Shakespeare was considered by many to be the greatest writer who ever lived. But attaining such a lofty position came with its downsides. And the more Shakespeare's popularity grew, the more scrutiny people began to pay to his life and work. Out of this scrutiny emerged a question. How could a man of such humble beginnings ever have possessed a level of learning required to become the greatest writer of all time? A genius whose legacy would go on to span the ages. To some, the answer to this question was rather simple. He couldn't, and he didn't. So, who did? We'll find out after a quick word about today's sponsor, and it's one Will really could have done with. I mean, have you seen that receding hairline? I too have a close friend who, like Shakespeare, started to struggle with hair loss in his 20s, and truthfully, it really got him down. And he's not alone. Did you know two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? But the best thing you can do to prevent hair loss is take the initiative now and do something about it whilst you still have hair left. You used to have to go to the doctor's office for a hair loss prescription, but now, thanks to Keeps, you can visit an online doctor 
and get the medication you need delivered directly to your door. I like Keeps because it makes treatment super easy by delivering your hair loss medication every three months so you can say goodbye to awkward doctor visits and waiting in pharmacy checkout lines. If you're like me, you're probably not ready to lose hair just yet, but prevention is key. The faster you act, the faster you see results, and the sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. If you're noticing you're losing your hair, do something about it. For a limited time, go to keeps.com forward slash 42 or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. Joseph Hart, in his book, The Romance of Yossing, released in 1848, is thought to have been the first person to suggest William Shakespeare was not the true author of the works attributed to him. Far from being dismissed as a peddler of literary blasphemy, as you might expect, Hart had opened the floodgates before the end of the century, at least 250 books had been published on the subject by a rapidly growing number of anti-Stratfordians. That's the name given to people who question the authorship of Shakespeare's works. It's a debate that's been raging ever since. Whoever wrote Shakespeare's works was clearly a smart guy. A genius, in fact. According to one evaluation, he had an IQ of 210. That's higher than Einstein. But his plays in particular also demonstrate an in-depth understanding of, amongst other things, court politics and culture, foreign countries and aristocratic sports like hunting, falconry and lawn bowling. With society at the time segregated in a way that's hard to imagine now, no commoner of the day should have known about these things. And William Shakespeare was no nobleman. He was born the son of a glover. Yes, that's someone who makes gloves. Not only did Shakespeare come from a modest background, no records survive of him ever having attended school. Plenty of geniuses throughout history have had little to no formal education, but they typically excel in fields like mathematics, where at least to a certain extent, you can discover the answers for yourself rather than having to be taught them. Srinivasa Ramanujan is a good example. The Indian mathematician had no training in pure mathematics and yet made important contributions to number theory and infinite series. But yeah, when it comes to falconry and the inner workings of the royal court, Someone just has to teach you that shit. Shakespeare's lack of education just doesn't jive with the learnings he displays in his writing. I mean, just take a look at the man's signature. Six examples survive today, and every single one of them looks like it was written by a blindfolded man wearing thumb screws whilst riding a roller coaster. Could handwriting this bad really belong? to the greatest writer of all time? According to anti-Stratfordians, no. In fact, they believe it's evidence that Shakespeare was actually illiterate. And that isn't the only thing about the Bard that doesn't quite add up. Even his name itself, William Shakespeare, is spelt more than 20 different ways when it crops up in historical records. The spelling we use today wasn't fixed until the 20th century to anti-Stratfordians, it's all a little fishy. And then there's Shakespeare's will, as in his last will and testament. I'm not just saying his name backwards. Which was written in entirely unpoetic, plain language and makes no mention of the kinds of possessions you might expect a man of letters to own. Books and papers, for example, or even any of the 18 Shakespeare plays that remained unpublished at the time of his death. This evidence has proven persuasive to many important people over the years. In fact, the likes of Walt Whitman, Mark Twain, Helen Keller, Henry James, Sigmund Freud, and Charlie Chaplin have all, at one time or another, endorsed the anti-Stratfordian argument that William Shakespeare that is, the man who we know lived and worked in Stratford-upon-Avon, 
did not write the plays attributed to him. But if he didn't write them, just who exactly did? Well, whilst anti-Stratfordians all agree who didn't write Shakespeare's plays, and that's Shakespeare, they're an awful lot less clear about who did. In fact, since the anti-Strats first started saying their nays in the middle of the 19th century, some 80 candidates have been put forward. The first to gain popularity was none other than Sir Francis Bacon, the philosopher and statesman who's credited with the codification of the scientific method. The idea that Sir Francis Bacon is the true author of Shakespeare's works was first developed by Delia Bacon, which is probably ringing some alarm bells right out of the gate. But don't worry, they weren't related. The link was made thanks to similarities between Bacon's work and Shakespeare's. Unlike Shakespeare, the knighted Bacon certainly had the upbringing and education to match the eloquence of the plays. He was a leading figure in the English Renaissance, had a Cambridge education, had travelled the world, and even had a genuine insight into court life, having been both a member of the Privy Council and the Lord High Chancellor of England. He also had a pretty good motive. The stigma of print that existed at the time meant it was considered beneath a man of Bacon's position to write plays for the common folk. By using William Shakespeare as a front for his clandestine play penning, Bacon was free to achieve his lofty goals in government. That all sounds plausible enough so far, kind of. But here's where things start to get a bit weird. Because many proponents of the Baconian theory of Shakespearean authorship, as it's known, also believe Bacon left clues revealing the truth encoded in the plays themselves. American physician and Baconian theorist Orville Ward Owen even built himself a cipher wheel, a device into which he fed the entire works of Shakespeare pasted to a 300 meter strip of canvas in order to better hunt for codes. And boy, did he find them. At the tail end of the 19th century, Owen published a series of books in which he claimed to have uncovered a whole secret history of the Elizabethan era encoded throughout Shakespeare's works, including the revelation that Bacon himself was the son of the not-so-virgin Queen Elizabeth, and was thus the true heir to the throne of England. If Dan Brown had been alive in Victorian times, he would have been this guy. Speaking of Dan Brown, in a plot worthy of one of his novels, it appeared Bacon had also found time to squeeze in a few codes, pointing to stores of documents hidden around the world, revealing him as the true author. Various Baconian theorists, including Orville Ward Owen himself, set off Robert Langdon style to track them down. They dredged the River Wye, searched for a hidden chamber in Canonbury Tower in London, and dug up at least two graves, though as far as I'm aware they didn't check behind the Cyclops' eye. And what did our budding cryptographers turn up with all this first-rate grave robbery and vandalism? The sum total of diddly squat. Contrary to popular belief, throwing enough shit at the wall is not always enough to make something stick. The cryptographic evidence gathered by the Baconian theorists was later analysed by legendary cryptographers William and Elizabeth Friedman, famous for their code-breaking efforts during the Second World War. Check out my video on the Voynich Manuscript for more of their exploits, by the way. Their study conclusively proved that all claims of ciphers and Shakespeare's plays were false. It was a telling blow for the Baconian theory. And though there is still a core of believers knocking around today in odd closets and taverns, the theory has largely fallen out of favour. The most popular candidate for the real William Shakespeare amongst anti-Stratfordians today is Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford. Known as the Oxfordian theory of Shakespeare authorship, this one is based largely on the parallels between the Earl's own life 
and Shakespeare's work. The Earl travelled extensively in Italy, a common setting for many of Shakespeare's plays, and on the discovery of the Vias Bible, which happens to contain numerous underlined passengers that crop up in Shakespeare's work, there is one minor setback with this one though. Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford, died in 1604, at which point 12 of Shakespeare's plays hadn't even been written yet. Yeah, the fact that the founder of this particular theory was called Thomas Looney pretty much sums this one up. The final candidate we're going to cover is Christopher Marlowe, a famous playwright and contemporary of Shakespeare. I bet you can't guess what this theory is known as. Yeah, not the most imaginative bunch, these anti-Stratfordians. If the Baconian theory of Shakespearean authorship could have come from the pen of Dan Brown, the Marlovian theory is more the style of Ian Fleming. You see, Christopher Marlowe wasn't just a famous writer, he was also a spy for the British government, recruited while studying at Cambridge University. But the life of an agent is a dangerous one, and when Double Marlowe 7 was accused by powerful people of having tempted good Christians to atheism, he found himself in a tight spot. Had he gone to trial, he would surely have been executed. Instead, so the theory goes, Marlowe faked his own death and went underground, where he promptly began publishing plays under a pseudonym, William Shakespeare. The timelines here are quite interesting. Despite having been born two months apart, the first mention of Shakespeare as a writer comes just 13 days after Marlowe's supposed death. And while Shakespeare's work bears little resemblance to any other writer of his time, it is, at least in places, strikingly similar to Marlowe's. Take a look at these two lines of poetry. The first was written by Marlowe in The Jew of Malta, to be delivered by the character Barabbas to his beloved Abigail, standing on a balcony above him. Look familiar? It should. The second is what Shakespeare came up with in Romeo and Juliet, in an almost identical scene. Coincidence? It seems unlikely, but is it really evidence of some grand conspiracy? Nah. For starters, a writer borrowing a line or two here and there isn't exactly unheard of. Plenty of authors have been sued for plagiarism over the years, including Dan Brown, by the way, multiple times though admittedly unsuccessfully. It feels like a bit of a stretch to suggest a prominent playwright faking his own death and spending the rest of his days writing under a pseudonym is more likely than Shakespeare just copying a line he quite fancied the sound of. And we do know, quite confidently in fact, that Shakespeare was partial to a spattering of plagiarism, or as writers like to call it, inspiration. As Mark Forsyth points out in his excellent book, The Elements of Eloquence, when Will wrote Antony and Cleopatra, he straight up nicked an entire paragraph of Thomas North's English translation of Plutarch's Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans. But taking a step backwards for a moment, the problem with this whole strange conspiracy theory is that it's based on one hell of a flimsy premise. As we've heard, there is no surviving evidence that Shakespeare ever received a formal education. No surviving evidence. I mean, Shakespeare was born 450 odd years ago, remember? Do you think your own school records will last that long? If Debbie from Admin from my childhood school has anything to do with it, definitely bloody not. And whilst it's true we can't prove Shakespeare went to school, it turns out no records from this period at all survive from the grammar school in Stratford-upon-Avon, which is where he would most likely have been educated. And yes, Shakespeare's handwriting was bad. But then, doctors are famous for having terrible handwriting, and I'm fairly sure most of them are literate. More importantly, the way Shakespeare wrote was perfectly normal for the time. 
particularly amongst playwrights, who used a style of writing called secretary hand, which had been developed not long before Shakespeare was born. And those weird shapes in amongst the letters? They're called breviographs. They're just symbols used for abbreviation. You might not find them in signatures these days, but some are still common, including the ampersand. And then, there's the whole reason these theories exist in the first place. The idea that Shakespeare had knowledge above his station, and that he shouldn't have been able to write in such detail about things so foreign to him. By that logic, anti-Stratfordians presumably believe Mario Puzo, author of The Godfather, was a Mafia Don, or that J.K. Rowling was educated under Albus Dumbledore at Hogwarts. Having a vivid imagination and a flair for empathy isn't exactly evidence of some great conspiracy, one that apparently nobody alive in Shakespeare's day ever suspected. And sure, writers of today have access to the internet, but Shakespeare would also have had access to valuable source material, including contemporary plays. It's even thought certain errors that crop up in his work, particularly relating to the classics, a field many anti-Stratfordians claim Shakespeare could have had no knowledge of, exactly match the errors known to be found in Thomas Cooper's Thesaurus Lingae Romani et Britannicae, a copy of which, it just so happens, was bequeathed to the grammar school in Stratford-upon-Avon not long before Shakespeare likely attended. With the original premise shaky at best, the rest of the house of cards built on top of it begins to look more than a little unstable. Which is why you'll have to walk a very long way to find a single respected Shakespeare scholar who actually believes any of this stuff. Having said that, there's never likely to be a way to prove it for sure, and you have to admit, the idea the real Will Shakespeare was a spy or perhaps the rightful heir to the throne of England is kind of appealing. There might be a pretty good play in that, actually. Thanks for watching. Thanks again to Keeps for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to try it out using the link below.